Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. We are Blockchain Co-Investors, the best way to invest in blockchain businesses. The title of today's webinar is What is DeFi and Why Does It Matter? My name is Mitch Michigan. I'm Chief of Staff at Blockchain Co-Investors. So as always, we have to show you this brief disclaimer. While we are an investment firm and we do offer investment products, nothing in this video or webinar should be construed as investment advice. This is purely for educational purposes only. So brief background on the firm. We are an integrated investment platform. We've been investing in this space since 2014. There are three main things we do, the first of which is a family of fund of funds. Through these funds, we're investors in 30 of the leading blockchain VCs. And through these funds, we have indirect exposure to more than 400 crypto projects and startups. The second thing we do is co-invest. So we take direct investments onto the cap table of the emerging sector leaders. We either do that through our SPV program or our AngelList syndicate. The last thing we do is that we're early stage token investors. So we do direct investments into pre mainnet launch tokens. So here at Blockchain Co-Investors, we also track all the recently minted blockchain unicorns. So as you can see, as of year end 2021, we counted 62 blockchain enterprise unicorns. So these are companies with uh, equity valuations greater than a billion. And similarly, there are about 130 crypto projects, so that's tokenized crypto startups with token valuations greater than a billion. You know, one of our strategies is to have broad sector coverage. And as you can see here, we are investors in more than half of the enterprise unicorns and about 40% of the crypto projects. So here's a summary of our performance. You can see that we have three, our first three funds, those are fund of funds. Uh, the last one, the Vintage 2021, just launched last year. And similarly, the fund four was our early stage, uh, early, uh, early stage token fund. So that launched just in the fall of last year. So our first two funds, which are now fully deployed or still deploying in the case of fund two are doing exceptionally well. Um, so obviously the returns have been outstanding uh, in particular for fund of funds. And you can see here on the next page that you know we are likely, and according to Prequent and PitchBook, the top performing fund of funds. Here's a brief overview of our co-investment program. So this is a program we've really started to ramp up uh, last year. You can see we did two investments in 2019, three in 2020, and many more in 2021. And that's a, a program that continues to grow. We'll briefly just touch on that performance. So for the co-investments, these are the larger allocations. You can see here the vintage and, and the performance thus far. Again, it's been um, you know, quite a good product for everyone involved. And similarly, our AngelList Syndicate has now grown to about 800 unique LPs. And so that's for allocations typically below a million. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to us at irblockchaincoinvestors.com or head to our website and you can try to join our syndicate. The final thing just to mention is that the founding partners of Blockchain Co-Investors, um, Allison Lamerly and Matthew, or Allison Davis and Matthew Lamerly, alongside Luke Kerner, another partner, are also the managers of the largest blockchain-focused SPAC. So this is Blockchain Co-Investors Acquisition Corp. 1. This IPO'd with $300 million in the trust, uh, which is essentially dry powder to try to purchase a private blockchain company that closed in November. And it's backed by an outstanding team, both inside the sponsor team and our banking partners, Cantor, Fitzgerald, and Mullis. So if you are interested in seeing uh, what our underlying funds invest in and what our exposure is uh, you know, in terms of the sector, please head to our portfolio section where you can toggle the different funds and see everything that we have direct and indirect exposure to. And similarly, if you'd like to see some of our confidential materials, you can reach out to us at ir at blockchaincoinvestors.com and we can get you a login to the investor access section. So now turning to today's webinar, what is DeFi and why does it matter? So briefly, the legacy financial system is antiquated and costly to its users. So decentralized finance or DeFi improves on the current system and allows for financial interaction without third-party intermediaries. And while not without its own risks, DeFi remains one of the most promising emerging use cases within blockchain development. So we'll start with a brief um, antidote here. So my personal bank, that's Chase. And you can see everything's great about Chase, except that I notice in my statements that I'm charged to receive wires. So domestic incoming wire fees. So this is from an, another US-based bank. I did some research and you know, some of the other large banks uh, often charge uh, more than $15 to receive a domestic wire. 
and I'm actually based in uh, London. So when I email my, or when I wire myself money, I have to uh, go through many more hoops, including wire recipient, SWIFT number, routing number, um, depending on the amount, often receive a call um, and charges are often in excess of 50 US dollars. So what does this all mean? Well, in my mind, it means that the current system is you know, overly costly, takes a lot of time, and takes a lot of human effort. So now just a brief overview of what the presentation will entail. First, we're gonna talk about what is DeFi and see how it seeks to solve some of these problems. Then we'll talk about the market overview and who some of the industry leaders are in terms of the DeFi ecosystem right now. And then finally, we'll just touch on why this is all important. So first, what is DeFi? Well, DeFi stands for decentralized finance, and DeFi allows for peer-to-peer -peer financial interactions. In other words, a financial system that functions without third-party intermediaries and accomplishes this by relying on cryptography, blockchain, and smart contracts. And you can see on the left here that DeFi is an emerging uh, set of subsectors. This is by no, uh, no means all-encompassing, and we'll get into the specifics a bit later in the presentation. So first, just a brief example of how the legacy financial system and DeFi uh, function differently in simplest terms. So take the legacy financial system um, and a, a very simple example of borrowing and lending. So say you're a homer, you have some capital, you'd like to earn a return on that capital in a safe way. Well, one option available to you is to deposit that into a bank for which you're going to receive interest payments. So Marge on the other side, she now wants to purchase something. And so she's gonna post some collateral at the bank. Maybe that's the thing she's gonna purchase like a house. And then she's gonna borrow against it and use that capital to make a purchase. She's also gonna to have to pay service payments um, you know, to the bank for providing this product. So you can see here that the bank sits in the middle, right? So it's fees are essentially the difference in the rates between the interest rate and the service payments. And you know, in simplest form, all financial institutions essentially are making a spread like this in some way, whether it's short or long duration or higher low rates. The bank is also gonna custodize the assets. So it'll determine where the assets are held and who holds them. It will require everyone's personal details to run Know Your Customer, KYC, or Anti-Money Laundering, AML. And it's gonna operate essentially what is a closed system. So it'll determine who can and cannot participate on both transactional ends. So you see here on the left, Chase, you know, we touched on them already there. They're, um, you know, legacy financial system that operates in this way. But arguably, a lot of the newer um, financial, you know, supposedly peer-to-peer -peer systems, such as Lending Club, you know, and the other peer-to-peer -peer markets of the late 2000s essentially function in the same way. So we would argue this legacy financial system needs an update. For one, its infrastructure hasn't been upgraded for the digital age. So it's an analog system based in the early 90s. It's inefficient. So you have delayed settlement T plus 2 to T plus 10. Um, because it requires massive amounts of human capital. I mean, someone physically has to call you often to do a wire, so that's not a very efficient system. Uh, the cost of transacting on these systems because of all the human capital and resources it takes it leads to massive inefficiency and, and high costs. These costs and frictions increase substantially when you transact internationally because of borders, uh, because of border regulations and institutional differences. Uh, we touched on this, but unequal access to banking services and high barrier to entry. And then finally, people don't think about this often, but counterparty risk. So in the current financial system, uh, the other party may not fulfill its contractual obligations um, you know, because they may not be able to, they may not be solvent. So let's take the same example, but now see how DeFi seeks to solve a similar problem. So you're Homer and you have a bunch of cash, but this time you're gonna take your cash, you're gonna convert it into USDC or USDT or Ethereum or another token. And you're gonna take that and you're gonna deposit it, this time not into a bank, but into a smart contract on a money market protocol or a liquidity pool. And in exchange, you're gonna receive a tokenized uh, asset as well, which is essentially a lien or a right to ownership of part of that liquidity pool. You're also gonna receive your interest rate payments in tokenized form. On the other transactional end, Marge, she's also gonna post collateral, but this time in tokenized form and borrow in, in, in some sort of token or cryptocurrency. She's also gonna service her debt payments uh, with, with tokens. So this system is non-custodial. So there's no um, you know, centralized institution sitting in the center. Everyone is just depositing their tokens into smart contracts that are operating automatically. Because of this, it's a completely open system. So the smart contracts and money market doesn't care where you are or who you are. 
And we already said this, but it's an automatic system. So settlement is much, much quicker because the funds and assets are moved around based on whether or not you fulfill certain obligations. The rates here are also going to be determined algorithmically by supply and demand. So you can see on the left here that Aave and Compound, which we'll talk about in more specifics later, are some of the largest money markets, um, primarily on the Ethereum ecosystem. So we think that DeFi improves on the current system. For one, its infrastructure is built with blockchain technology for digital age. It's efficient, so it has fully automated settlement in seconds, no user information required. You have potential cost reductions. With scale, the cost of transacting can be pennies, and it's already very, very efficient if you're moving large amounts of capital. It's borderless, so location is irrelevant to transacting. You, all you need is an internet connection. This leads to greater access, so anyone can participate on both transactional ends. And in terms of barriers to entry, all the protocols are open source code, so they can be iterated upon and outcompeted if, if someone has a better idea. And reduced counterparty risk. So your obligations are governed by smart contracts and code. So if, if something is supposed to, to happen, the smart contract will just execute it in that way. However, there are risks, and this is a nascent technology. So some of the key risks to highlight are smart contract failure. So you have bugs in code can affect how existing smart contracts operate. That can also lead to hacks. So we've seen several successful hacks um, of DeFi protocols in which hackers exploited smart contracts in some way that was unexpected, causing tokens to be stolen or placed into a wallet that they weren't supposed to go into. Uh, there are also liquidations. So because the collateral you may be posting uh, is the underlying asset that you're posting might be a volatile cryptocurrency, the value of your collateral could drop suddenly, uh, causing you to lose that collateral in a margin call. And then finally, network fees and congestion. You know, as we'll talk about, um, primarily Ethereum, but other layer ones have seen large amounts of use, which has led to high gas prices and consequently high costs of transacting, often upwards of $100 to $200 just for a single transaction. So now that you know what DeFi is, let's talk a little bit about the market and some other areas outside of money markets and who the industry leaders are. So the DeFi subsectors we've seen uh, have started to expand. So this is by no, all no, uh, by no means all encompassing. Um, this would really be you know, the first generation of the DeFi subsectors that have started to come out. So we already touched on money markets. That's where you borrow and lend currencies. So Aave and Compound, again, just want to point those out. Maker, also another very large one. There's also decentralized exchange, such as Uniswap. So that's where the liquidity pool now facilitates the exchange of tokens in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. You have derivatives markets, such as SynthetX, where you can get on-chain exposure via derivative contracts. We have margin trading, such as DYDX. That's a very prominent exchange, but that allows you to uh, you know, borrow on margin to increase exposure to assets. We have insurance markets, such as Nexus Mutual, very interesting protocol. So this is a uh, decentralized insurance uh, protocol, which allows you to uh, insure against some of those risks that we mentioned. So say, for instance, that you want to uh, post some collateral on Aave and then borrow against it, you could actually insure that collateral against a hack using Nexus Mutual. And then finally, stable coins, very, very important to the DeFi ecosystem um, because they allow you to move in and out of volatile assets, at least volatile and compared to when, when pegged to a fiat currency. So the stable coins often seek to maintain a peg one-to-one, -one, uh, primarily to the US dollar. Um, and here, you, there, there's basically a scale of decentralization. So on the one hand, you have uh, many prominent stable coins are fully centralized or managed by a central institution. So think USDC, that's managed by a consortium of Coinbase and Circle. Um, and then on the other side, you have algorithmic stable coins that seek to maintain the peg by burning supply or increasing supply based on supply and demand. Those haven't um, worked thus far um, extremely well, though they're still trying uh, new iterations. Probably the most decentralized is DAI, which is an asset-backed stablecoin that holds a pool of decentralized um, tokens and cryptocurrencies. However, they do hold you know, some centralized uh, stablecoins such as USDC. So again, it's a, it's a bit of a scale, but very, very important, uh, both the decentralized and centralized iterations of stablecoins. So we've also seen a supportive ecosystem emerging. Here's the technology stack. Again, very, very simplified version. But on the bottom, you have the blockchains, essentially the settlement layer, the infrastructure layer, 
uh, really important to point out Ethereum here, as you'll see, you know, on the next slide, Ethereum is by far and away where the lion's share of the DeFi activity is occurring. But also uh, notable layer ones are Binance Smart Chain and Solana, uh, as well as uh, Polygon, uh, Terra, and Avalanche. On top of that, you get Oracles. So just want to point out Oracles for a moment. Um, so Chainlink is one of the most popular. Chainlink essentially delivers data on chain. Uh, so you have a smart contract that's going to operate uh, in a certain way and it needs data such as a price. Well, then Chainlink, they can uh, deliver that data to the smart contract. On top of that, you have the cryptocurrencies. I already mentioned DIME USDC. And then you get to the consumer layer. So MetaMask, really important here. MetaMask is a Chrome browser that's probably the most important wallet in the DeFi ecosystem. So that's a self-hosted wallet that allows you to plug into the other consumer apps such as Uniswap or Aave or Balancer Curve, you know, whatever you want to you want to do in the DeFi ecosystem, you can open up your MetaMask or any of the other wallets and, and basically plug right in. So as you can see on this chart, and we'll pause here for a moment, um, you know, the gross value locked, or as we would call it DeFi deposits, so the total amount of capital contributed to uh, the, the ecosystem has grown substantially. And that was really kicked off with DeFi summer in, uh, in, in late June, 2020, basically when Compound released their token. And so you can see again here that it's grown substantially, but most of the activity is still happening on the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, and that's really where DeFi got its start. But in recent months, uh, many other layer ones are starting to pop up with some DeFi activity. And that's primarily because Ethereum's seen a significant congestion on its network, uh, meaning that because lots of people are using it, the price to use it has gone up substantially and um, the transactions per second uh, just isn't there to support all the activity that wants to occur. So we really saw, you know, first uh, Binance Smart Chain, BSC, uh, come onto the scene and often uh, very low cost transacting uh, in very similar, you know, it was essentially a fork of the Ethereum chain and then they just reduce the number of nodes. So it was very easy for you know projects because it's all open source to be to be ported over. And so Avalanche is similar to that and Polygon. Polygon's actually layer two built on top of Ethereum. Um, you know, Solana is not um, you know, EVM compatible. So it's not very easy to move things over from Ethereum to Solana. So that activity there is, is really organic in a lot of ways. And so you know everyone's really watching these, not really sure who's gonna uh, be able to displace Ethereum in terms of, of DeFi leader if Ethereum will, will continue to, to host the lion's share of that activity. And at the protocol la layer, so again, the consumer or the consumers actually interface with these things, um, you see that there's several projects with more than a billion locked in them. Um, so the biggest one being Maker, they've really displaced Aave, who was in the lead for you know, probably most of the last year. Um, and they're a, a, a money market lending uh, you know, borrowing lending, as we talked about. Um, but again, you can see here the chain that most of these are operating on the Ethereum chain. And even Aave, which has multi-chain, the lion's share of their activity is going on on Ethereum. You know, and, and, you know, we touched on this at the beginning, but part of our strategy is that broad sector coverage. So we've put a logo next to the decentralized protocols that we have exposure to, whether directly or indirectly. And now to wrap up the, the market overview section, we'll just go through some of the key developments in 2020. Um, and we've touched on these a bit, but just to, to put them in, in context, we had the growth of liquidity incentives. So in order to kickstart many DeFi projects, uh, because you need that liquidity provided in a decentralized manner, the protocol started offering APY incentives or yield for you to come commit capital um, to get that, that gross value um, you know, started up um, if you're a startup project. And consequently, there's an explosion in what's been deemed yield farming um, in this area. We also saw stable coins, again, touched on this. Uh, those started to explode to lot, uh, tons of capital pouring into stable coins. Um, you can look on the block.com and see all of the uh, rise in, in the money flowing into stable coins uh, by virtue of their market caps. So again, the most prominent uh, are USDC, so that's the Coinbase backed one, and USDT, which is Tether. We also saw the adoption of decentralized governance. So many DeFi projects launch with a ambition of progressive decentralization. Um, and so that came to fruition for many projects this year where they assumed a DAO governance model. So DAO is decentralized autonomous organization, probably warrants its own webinar to discuss the implications of DAO, which are very interesting and, and 
you know, innovating part of cryptocurrency right now. So Aave is a great example. So Aave, um, you know, was, was VC backed and, and started the protocol um, essentially with a centralized governance model, but they released a token, the Aave token. Aave token is a governance token. So if you purchase the Aave token, you can participate on chain in the voting um, in the governance of the protocol. So that goes from everything to which code to implement, which updates um, to who's in leadership positions, et cetera. And then finally, emergence of play to earn. So very, very interesting. Again, warrants its own webinar um, and only tangentially related to DeFi, but just wanted to put this here because um, you know, blockchain is now really being started, uh, really started being applied to in-game economies. So there are financial and economic systems within games that have been for, for decades. Um, but that that in-game capital that you accrue, you know, you're not it's not composable if you're not able to take it in and out of the game and spend it on other things. So blockchains being applied to this, um, you know, the most prominent probably being Axie Infinity or Splinterlands, uh, where in Axie Infinity you can actually earn Ethereum in the game, and then your Ethereum, you know, you can spend it on things unrelated to uh, Axie Infinity. So why is this all important? Well, we here at Blockchain Co-Investors, we're strong believers that blockchain holds the potential to revolutionize several industries. And so it's been a rapidly growing market with a you know, multi-trillion dollar market cap and billions invested in venture capital in the space since 2015. And the reason being is that there's potential for blockchain to revolutionize industries through digitalization. So as you've seen, the legacy financial systems, but other systems are falling behind in terms of access, efficiency, and cost. And because of that, there's strong enterprise and consumer demand for natively digitalized systems. And then on a philosophical level, you know, blockchain co-investors, we believe that peer-to-peer -peer interaction um, could better uh, individual sovereignty. So the promise of individual sovereignty over financial assets, personal data, and other resources is also closely tied to the success of blockchain. And thus far, DeFi remains one of the most promising use cases of, of blockchain technology and likely was the first real use case that burst onto the scene again in summer of 2020. Since then, we've also seen the rise of, of gaming as we just touched on, but also content and NFTs. And there are several others in the pipeline, which is very exciting. But DeFi, you know, with nearly 200 billion in gross value locked, uh, you know, really has demonstrated uh, the potential use case of, of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. So just to recap briefly, Today, we learned that the legacy financial system is antiquated and costly to its users. DeFi improves on this current system and allows for financial interaction without third-party intermediaries. And while not without its own risks, which we talked about, DeFi remains one of the most promising emerging use cases within blockchain development. So if you found this webinar interesting, you can head to our website, blockchaincoinvestors.com slash webinars to see others, or you can head to fitthera.com slash resources we have uh, interesting articles, uh, blog posts, um, you know, and other, other great content that you can check out. Thanks for joining us today. We are Blockchain Co-Investors, the best way to invest in blockchain businesses.